Hey, welcome to Oakland. Thanks for joining us today. Our mission is to love God, love others, and make disciples. If you're a guest, we're glad you're here, and we'd like to connect with you. Be sure to check out the special invitation to do so in the description of this video on the Oakwood YouTube channel. It's good for us to be together, even if we can't all be at the same place at the same time. It looks like the worship experience is getting started. So find your favorite spot, greet your family, join in the chat if you like, and let's worship Jesus together. Hi friends and family. We just wanted to send you a quick video update so you could see for yourselves just how well we are doing. Um, I know so many of you wrote to tell us you were praying, but also how worried you were because of how horrible I in particular looked last Saturday. And to tell you the truth, I was feeling horrible. It really took a lot out of me, this, this illness. And so I just, we want to show you that this week has been full of answered prayer and we want to share a little bit about that and let you know that we feel so much better. Um, on Tuesday this week, through your prayers and through just miraculous intervention, I was able to connect with the clinic and video conference with a doctor and then was able to go drive over to the clinic and have a test done to see if what we have been experiencing is has been in fact COVID-19. And we weren't even supposed to get the results back until this next week, but we got them back early and found out last night actually that we do have COVID-19 or have had it in our home. So Kaylin and Brad and I um, have all been infected with it. That email Saturday last week when you guys started praying was the time that Katie's fever broke and she no longer had any fever. So we attribute all of that to the mighty hand of God and many, many hundreds of you that were praying. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been good for us to know just for sure what's been going on. It was in, it's been in, incredibly sobering too, knowing so many out there are fighting for their lives or have lost their lives from this. We just are incredibly grateful and humbled that we have not had to have hospitalization and we've been able to weather through this at home. So thank you for praying us through. There's been some discouraging days and some hopeful days, but overall we've really sensed the Lord's presence in all of this. This last week, um, as I was struggling through some different things and whatnot, I came across a devotional that was in the book of Zechariah particularly in chapter 9, um, just sharing through one of the prophecies there and just a line that really stood out to me and grabbed my heart. I know you've all been in those places where a line just grabs your heart as it says, return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. The Lord is our fortress, that we return to Him, we run to Him in these places of darkness in our lives. Um, and you would find yourself a prisoner of hope, unable to get away from the one who came to bring us hope and to bring us life. In Psalm 29:10, it tells us that God sat enthroned above the flood and he sits enthroned above COVID-19 and all of our circumstances today. He's not surprised, he's not wringing his hands. He is sovereign and he is in control and he longs for us to be anchored in hope. Isaiah 53, 6, for, the, for all the iniquity has fallen on him, he has paid for it all. I, I paraphrase it, and it's a verse of salvation. It's one of my favorites out of Isaiah. From Isaiah 41, verse 10 through 15, Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will hold you up righteous in my righteous right hand. Good morning, Oakwood. As a, a new follower of Jesus, we started a Bible club at our public high school in New York. And each week, I would sit down with a yellow legal pad, and I would write out a manuscript of exactly what I wanted to say, and then when we got together, I would read it word for word. And sometimes I remember 
going into that room where we were scheduled to meet and I would just, I'd be there alone and I'd just wish, wish that no one else would come. <laughs> and you know friends, often I got my wish. And the interesting thing is that summer I had a, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And through getting to know the person of the Holy Spirit, developing a friendship with Him, and learning prayerful dependence on Him, everything changed. And after that summer, I, I went back to school and the Lord helped me in an unexpected way. There was a, a new friend that I made at school. His name was John. And John was only at our school for a very short time before his family moved, but he was totally an answer to prayer. And what we had, we used to have this little shoe box where we invited people to write in a question or, you know, a, a comment. And there was only every so often maybe we'd get a comment or two in there and I, I my friend John he had this amazing way of sharing critical feedback but in a loving wonderful way and as a question so in this in this what we call the God box I would get, get a question like hey have you ever thought of asking questions instead of uh, just giving a speech or have you ever thought of what it would look like to do this together as a team instead of trying to do it all yourself? And you know, it was amazing that uh, those years of, of serving with, we called it Truth Seekers Bible Club, it was some years of real learning. And uh, it, was a, it was a time for me of learning about the power of a team and groups and the power of what happens when a group of people get together and open up God's Word and ask good questions. And that journey has continued. In more recent years, Sweet Bridget and I were introduced to a tool called uh, the Discovery Group Process. And you'll notice that we included in your online bulletin the Discovery Questions. It's a tool that we can use to connect with our, our families or friends and you can open up to any passage of the Bible together and seek to understand it, apply it, and share it in our lives. And it begins, you'll see, with some questions helping us check in. What are we thankful for? What challenges are we facing? Making us aware of the needs of those in our group and also the needs of others around us and how we can help and how we can serve each other, how we can pray. Then we agree to just discuss the passage for today. And that's important because it helps us stay focused and avoid distraction. And also it helps those that are newer to the Bible connect and, and feel comfortable and be part of the group as well. And then you read the passage two times aloud. We read it twice because it, it helps us make sure that we're really tracking with what God's word is saying and that we haven't missed any parts. And then we retell it in our own words, like we're telling a friend that isn't here with us. We do that because it gets us in the habit of sharing and also it checks our understanding to make sure again that we captured all that was in that passage or at least a good chunk of it. And then there's three important questions. The, the first one is what stood out to you and why? What does this tell us about God, about Jesus, about his plan? And what does this tell us about people or about us? And you'll notice that those three questions we also included in your bulletin outline today. Because as we're walking through the message, I want to encourage you to share those things with us. Maybe right here in the chat, something will stand out to you, or you'll discover something about God, or you'll discover something about people, about us. And we'd love to have you share that with us. Now, for anyone that just wants to um, turn off the chat during this message time, that's totally fine too. If you click on the bottom corner of the video, you can choose full screen and that'll cause the, the video to go full and the chat to, to go away during this time. So let's, let's continue. We're going to dive in together to Isaiah chapter 61. If you'd like to grab your Bible or maybe pull up the Bible app on your phone. And here's what God's word has to say for us, beginning in verse 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, 
to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. And you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among all peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Well, friends, as I was preparing for this message, I used a tool called Three Column Study, and I did it right here in my journal. You can use a piece of paper, a journal, wherever you'd like to do a three column study. And we've also included a link for you in the online bulletin right underneath the discovery questions where you could download this tool. It's a tool for personal study as you're spending time with the Lord, delighting in his word. And how it works is first, in the first column, you write the passage word for word. Then you write it in your own words. And in the third column, that's the place where we identify our I will or how we want to apply this in our life and our plan to share, someone that we'd like to share with, something that we discovered. You'll notice those are also the last two questions of the discovery group process when you're doing it together with others. And if you're doing this together with a group, then when you come back next time, you check in and you say, hey, how did it go applying this in your life? How did it go sharing with others what we're discovering? This was my retelling. I'd like to read it for you. This is what, in my own words, what Isaiah 61, what stood out to me. The Spirit's on me to announce good news, help, healing, freedom to the poor, hurting, captives, prisoners, comfort for those who are grieving, to become oaks firmly planted by the Lord as there are so many ruins made by humanity. His people have a calling as priests and ministers. He'll provide for them and give them joy because he loves justice. He's made an everlasting promise with his people, and all will acknowledge they're blessed by him. So we delight and rejoice in him because he's clothed his people in beautiful clothes, and he causes new life to grow. That growth is righteousness, what's right, and praise in front of all the nations. So that's what jumped out to me as I retold it. And as you read it, maybe there were other things, a reminder, or I'd love to hear from you what stood out to you and why. What are you discovering about God? What are you discovering about people, about us, as we go through this together? Feel free to share that with us in the chat. And now let's walk through, starting in verse 1, verse by verse, begin our second retelling here. Verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord, is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Another way to say preach is announce, announce. 
And you know that Roger has named this series that we're in the gospel according to Isaiah. The gospel according to Isaiah. Gospel means good news. So here, Isaiah says, Holy Spirit's on us so that we can announce good news. All over this amazing book, well, this whole book, but this <laughs> book of Isaiah that we've been digging into in recent weeks is the good news. Just saturated, soaked all the way through is the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And this chapter is no exception. Here it starts talking about the Holy Spirit. And actually, if you take some time this week with your group to use the discovery questions, you'll notice that we've included for you a passage from Luke chapter 4, which is where Jesus stands up and reads from this chapter and shows that it's all fulfilled in him. It's pointing ahead toward him and his people. So you'll love that. Enjoy that when you get to it. But here, as we talk about announcing the good news, this these verses say that it's about how we walk and it's about how we talk. It's about announcing with our words, but also demonstrating in our actions as we help and pray and heal and care for those that are in need. I mean, how relevant is that to this time that we're in where the world is suffering, our neighbors may be struggling, people around us have all kinds of needs, spiritual, emotional, and physical, and we can be those that are announcing good news and helping at this time. Part of how we've explained this to our Wednesday night uh, disciple-making group, Ignite, is think about, imagine for a minute that your family's praying for a car. And you're without a car, but you're praying, Lord, provide for us a vehicle. We trust you to provide for us. And just when you say amen as a family, the phone rings. You pick up the phone and it's a friend of yours saying, you know, I don't know exactly why I'm calling you right now, except to say I felt a nudge to do it. I heard about this car that's for sale. It's a pretty good price. I thought it might be a fit for your family. And it's exactly what you prayed for. It's exactly perfect for your family. Just what you need. Then Literally, that night, you're scheduled to get on Zoom and connect with your online group. What do you tell them? Oh my goodness, I'm sure you tell them, Jesus is amazing. Let me tell you how he answered our prayer. We prayed immediately. He answered. He's so wonderful. He provides for us. I'm sure you give him the glory, right? And you tell that story. Now, imagine it's not that you're getting together with your group, but you're going to work. Maybe a different group of people. And maybe they're not all on the same page as you spiritually. How do you talk about what happened? Do you say, oh, man, really cool. We needed a car. We got a car. Whew, great. Do we leave Jesus out of the story? Friends, this element of announcing good news, part of what that looks like is being who we are, wherever we are, and whoever we're with. We're consistent. We, we wear our faith on our sleeve. It's who we are. We tell true stories about how Jesus is at work in our life and the difference that our relationship with him makes. That's part of what announcing good news can look like. So verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now this is something that stood out to me as I was doing my three-column study in preparation for this message. You notice it talks about a year and a day. A year and a day. And it says that the year is the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vengeance or a day of punishment, a day of judgment. Isn't that interesting that it's a whole year of favor and a day of vengeance? Now, I've heard it said that for those who've trusted in Jesus, there's no longer any punishment for God to give. Does that strike you as strange? Here's, here's what that true uh, promise and what that truth means. When we put our trust in Jesus, the Bible says that our, our sin, the, the wrong choices, are the ways that in our thoughts and attitudes and actions we've broken God's law. That sin gets put on Jesus, and the righteous, perfect life that Jesus lived is given to us. It's accredited to us. So that means that Jesus took our punishment. If we would turn from our sin and trust in Jesus, then there is no longer any punishment. Then we can live in the Lord's favor. And yes, there is a day of vengeance, a day of judgment coming, friends, for those who are not willing to receive this forgiveness from Jesus. But his desire is for us to experience a year of the Lord's favor, to walk in his favor, to experience his forgiveness. Well, 
let's continue uh, in verse 3. It's going to speak more about this idea of comforting those who mourn. It, comfort all who mourn, provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Let's pause there for a moment. Nate sent a great article out to our staff about what we're feeling in this season of social distancing and all the, all the new things that are happening. And the article said, what you're feeling is called grief. And that might strike us as strange, but you know, in the midst of this, it came on so suddenly, there is a surprise element of it. There's a feeling of loss, change, and unexpected change. And you know, for some of us that are retired, we're, we're missing our grandkids, we're missing routines that we might have come to enjoy. For some of us, we're struggling with all the technology that we need to use in this season. Others of us are trying to figure out how to how to help our kids do school at home and how to love them well in the process. Some of us, our jobs have been deemed essential and so we're, we're going to work and we're trying to navigate all the extra stress of that in this strange season. Some of us are figuring out new rhythms of how to work from home. And some of us may even be unemployed, you know, that we've lost our jobs in this season. A lot of change, a lot of loss, a lot of potential for feeling grief. And, you know, in addition to that, I mean, how much more for those that have lost a loved one during this time? I know uh, for us personally, last month we lost um, a cousin in New York who passed away. And just last week, we lost a dear friend here in Wisconsin. And, and grief is a real uh, heavy, serious thing, friends. And we're not designed to try and go it alone, to try and uh, deal with it alone. And that's why uh, groups are so powerful. And in this season, I'm so thankful that we have several groups that are meeting online. We've included the online group opportunities PDF for you in your bulletin. And you can go in your online bulletin and download that and connect with a group. Because again, we, we can't go it alone. We need each other, especially in this time with so much grief. But we can find comfort in the midst of the grief that we're feeling. And continuing in verse 3, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. When Sweet Bridget and I were in South Africa, we heard a message where the brother referred to this uh, passage. And as he read it, he started laughing. You know, oaks of righteousness. Oh yeah, we're righteous oaks. And everybody's laughing and we kind of felt like we were on the outside of an inside joke, you know. But we realized later that in South Africa, kind of like the, the word blokes, there's an expression, oaks, O-K-E-S, which is referring to people. So when they say righteous oaks, it fit pretty well. <laughs> but, you know, as I was going through this chapter as part of our community Bible experience earlier this year, this verse jumped out to me and I just thought, Oakwood, this is our verse. We are oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. That just spoke to me so powerfully and I pray it resonates with you too. By God's grace, let's be these righteous oaks planted to display the splendor of the Lord. Let's continue in verse 4. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Another interesting thing that stood out to me here was another contrast. Do you notice how what the Lord plants, oaks of righteousness, is living and vibrant and doing well? versus what people build gets ruined, destroyed, dead. The living things that the Lord builds versus the ruins of what people build, what humanity builds. Well, it continues now, verses 5 through 6. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called, the Lord says to his people, priests of the Lord. You'll be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. God uses a powerful word picture here for his people. He's saying to them, you know all the, the jobs that you're used to doing, like shepherding your flocks or working the fields, working the vineyards? You're going to have to find other people, other strangers, people you don't even know, are going to have to take those jobs because, listen, I've got an important job for you. 
all of my people are to be priests and ministers. What? Does that jump out to you as strange? Remember a couple weeks ago when we celebrated the Lord's Supper together, Roger mentioned this truth that Peter talks about in the New Testament, the priesthood of all believers. We, friends, if we're followers of Jesus, if we've trusted in Jesus, we are all called to be priests and ministers, to represent our Lord Jesus through our profession, excuse me, through our profession, through our work. Whatever we do, we're to be priests and ministers in the midst of that. So does that mean that there's not this, you know, higher spiritual class of clergy and then everybody else is down a little lower? Yeah, that's that's a false idea. We need to to reject that idea because the Bible says we are all priests and ministers if we follow Jesus. Some of us are really blessed and thankful that we get to as our job work on staff at a church. That's a great a great gift, a great blessing. But the truth of the matter is that we are all called to be priests and ministers for our Lord. That's who he says we are. And continuing now in verse 7. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. They will inherit a double portion in their land. And everlasting joy will be theirs. How wonderful is that, friends? Now, good point to pause and just remember that when Isaiah was writing these words, he was writing to the people of Israel. And so are there some of these promises, like talking about rebuilding ancient ruins and inheriting a land that are special, that are unique to Israel? Yes, absolutely. Promises that were given for Israel that are for Israel, that we expect to be fulfilled in the, in the last days, that we're watching and looking to see the Lord fulfill his promises to Israel. And at the same time, are there principles here that we can discern about who God is, how he interacts with people, and that we can ask the Lord to apply those principles in our lives? Yes, I believe there are. Like here, the truth that the Lord gives his people everlasting joy. Just wonderful. Continuing now in verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. When I was reading this uh, passage, preparing for the message, and when I got to this verse, as I'm doing my three-column study, and I heard that word justice, all of a sudden, Holy Spirit brought to mind a friend of ours in Waukesha. And I just felt this prompting. Send a message. See how they're doing. Now, what's more important, finishing a project or listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit? Well, I tried to finish my project. I was in the middle of a project, but that's not the, uh, that's not the right answer. So the Lord wouldn't let up. He kept prompting. He kept nudging. He kept nudging until I paused and sent a message to that friend. How are you doing? Is there anything you need during this time? Oh, continuing, verse 9. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. How awesome is that, huh? This, again, ties back to what we were saying in the beginning about announcing good news, that do people know us? Do people know us by our faith in Jesus? Do we make it obvious that we're spiritual people? Again, do we wear our, our faith on our sleeve and just make it obvious that we belong to Jesus so that those who are spiritually seeking know they can come to us. They can ask questions. We'll be willing to pray for them, that we ask good questions to help others think about spiritual things as well. I heard a story recently from a free church leader about connecting with a family that he hadn't seen in a while. And he said as he was interacting with the family, he was joking a little bit and he was joking even with their young son and, and said to him, hey, do you remember my name? And the little boy nodded and he said, yeah, church. And as that leader was reflecting on that idea, he thought, what an honor that that little guy associated me with church with God's people. You might have seen the video that Nate made recently where he said, let's be the church. The church isn't a building. The church isn't a place we go. The church is God's people according to his word. We are the church. Are we known for being those called out by God, those living for Jesus everywhere we go? 
everywhere he sends us, even electronically and online during this season. Well, continuing in verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He's clothed us in, in beautiful new clothing. He's made us new through our faith in Jesus. Not because of anything we've done, not because of anything we've earned, but because of a free gift that our Lord Jesus paid for us on the cross so that we could be made one with him, so we could be united with him as the bride of Christ. That's what he calls us as his people, right? Verse 11, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. <laughs> Do you catch that? The new life of spring he talks about here, the hope of new things. And then he speaks about what are those two things that spring up? Righteousness and praise. The way we walk, righteousness, being defined by a right relationship with him, flowing out into right relationships with others, righteousness, the way we walk, and praise. The way we talk, the way we talk about him, the way we give him the glory and we sprinkle spiritual conversation, our love for him into our everyday life and language and conversation. And you notice again, friends, what springs up is that righteousness. So Oakwood, Oaks of Righteousness, by God's grace, let's let this be the defining feature of our lives as we live for him in this season and until he returns. Let me pray for us. Oh, our, our Lord and our God, we love you. And we pray by your Holy Spirit that you would help us, Lord, to live out this disciple-making way of life, to live for you, Lord, and to allow praise and to allow right relationship with you and right relationship with others to be the defining feature of our lives. We pray this, Lord, that you would cause it to be by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, you'll notice in your online bulletin, you have the next steps to identify your I will. How is God asking you to take a next step to apply this in your life and a place to identify someone that you'd like to share with, someone that would be blessed in their spiritual journey if you shared with them something that you discovered today. And just a few final thoughts that we'd, we'd love to encourage you if you have questions about how to start a discovery group. Sweet Bridget and I are, are really having fun connecting with our neighbors online and using the discovery questions to open up God's word together. We'd love to chat with you about how you can do that as well. And just to know too, we're here for you. We're praying for you. If there's any way that we can care for you or help you or support you as you are praying for and caring and reaching out to your neighbors, let us know. Now receive this blessing as it comes from our Lord Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace, his shalom, in Jesus' name. Amen.